So I hope you will have a relaxing spot to listen. I would like to introduce this evening's participants. This evening, you will meet two individuals who are well versed in tonight's topic. Our guest host this evening is Jonathan Berkey. He is a professor of history at Concord University at Athens, West Virginia. He received his PhD and MA from Pennsylvania State University after studying at Gettysburg College. He has contributed scholarship on the Civil War's impact on Shenandoah Valley citizens to several publications, including the Civil War and the Transformation of American Citizenship, edited by Paul Quigley, and the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1862, edited by Gary Gallagher. He is now completing a study examining how civilians waged war in Virginia's lower Shenandoah Valley. And as guest host, Jonathan will introduce tonight's presenter, Jonathan Royales. We are recording the webinar tonight, so if you need to leave early, you may um, check back. It will be uploaded and available for the public view um, through the weekend. And then we will um, save it for our membership benefits in the future. And we'd love to hear from you this evening. So part of the, the design of this webinar series is to make it more interactive. Um, we'll have our two panelists talking, but we want you to join the conversation as well. So please use the Q&A feature as we go along. I will be monitoring the chat, but hopefully the questions will pop up in the Q&A. The presenters and I will see your comments and questions, but they will remain anonymous to the general audience. So let's see, what time is it? It's about five after, if you're just joining us. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, I am pleased to start our conversation on Little Massachusetts Unionists in Martinsburg and Berkeley County by turning the virtual mic over to our guest host, Jonathan Berkey. Thank you, Patty. I appreciate it. And thank you, all of you who are uh, out there watching uh, this evening. We appreciate you being here. It is certainly my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Jonathan Noyalis. Jonathan is director of the McCormick Civil War Institute at Shenandoah University. He is the author of set or editor of several books on various aspects of the Civil War in the Shenandoah Valley, including Slavery and Freedom in the Shenandoah Valley during the Civil War era, which came out this year. Uh, as Penny said, the title of Jonathan's presentation this evening is Little Massachusetts, Unionists in Martinsburg and Berkeley County. So Jonathan, thank you for joining us. I am glad to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I want to thank Jonathan for that introduction. I've known Jonathan for a, a long time, and we agree about a lot of stuff except for football. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. He's a Miami Dolphins fan. But other than that, uh, we get along quite well. Um, I want to thank Penny and Rocktown History for inviting me uh, to share some thoughts and perspectives about Martinsburg and Berkeley County. Um, you know, having lived in Martinsburg for more than 15 years. Um, I feel that the history here is quite compelling um, and it offers an interesting window uh, into unionist sentiment in the Shenandoah Valley. For Corporal Charles Lynch, his comrades in the 18th Connecticut Infantry, Martinsburg, West Virginia had the feeling of a second home by the time the regiment reached there on July the 11th, 1864. So over the previous two years, the 18th Connecticut Infantry had been in Martinsburg on numerous occasions. They had been there under various circumstances. And when, he, when Corporal Lynch arrived in Martinsburg on the 11th, by the end of that day, he sat down as he did customarily throughout um, his uh, three years of military service. And he wrote, that Martinsburg is quote unquote, our hometown. Now, while familiarity with Martinsburg was partially responsible for that feeling, there was something else that added to that comfort that Lynch and his comrades in the 18th Connecticut possessed. Martinsburg possessed the most substantial unionist population 
of any community in the Shenandoah Valley. While Lynch wrote of visiting Unionist friends while he was in Martinsburg, not only July 11th, 1864, but on previous occasions, other Union soldiers who spent time in this community noticed that Martinsburg and its immediate surrounding environs, it, it was a very, very unique place in the Shenandoah Valley in terms of the amount of Unionists and the strength of Unionist sentiment that existed in Martinsburg. More than two years earlier, Sheldon Colton, who was an officer in the 67th Ohio Infantry, wrote his mother that Martinsburg contained some pretty good Union men and women. They are very kind to us and they help us all that they can. As Virginia in the early part of 1861, support for remaining in the Union, it remains strong throughout the entire Shenandoah Valley. 15 of the 19 delegates who represented the Valley's communities at the secession convention in Richmond were pro-Unionist, including both of those delegates from Berkeley County, Edmund Pendleton and Alan Hammond. So many of our viewers this evening, you're fully aware that, that there were two votes of the Virginia Secession Convention. There was a vote taken on April 4th, 1861. Both Pendleton and Hammond voted against secession during that vote. And then 13 days later, on April 17th, following the opening salvos of the war at Fort Sumter and President Lincoln's subsequent call for 75,000 volunteers to suppress the rebellion, both Pendleton and Hammond again voted against secession. Now, although Hammond later changed his vote and eventually signed the Ordinance of Secession. Edmund Pendleton, who was who earned the, the title of Edmund the Staunch and Steady for his support of Union, he never wavered in his support. He refused to sign the Ordinance and he remained consistent in his support of the Union throughout the course of the conflict. And the map that you're looking at on the screen right there, this is, a, I think, rep, is, a, is a good visual representation of the Unionist sentiment in the Valley. All those blue dots are delegates who voted against secession during that second vote on April 17, 1861. And you can clearly see Berkeley County, Jefferson, Clark, Frederick, um, Rockingham, Augusta, half of Rockbridge, um, they are all voting against secession. Now, while it is true that Unionist sentiment throughout the Valley waned in the wake of Virginia's secession. So you had a lot of what we would call conditional unionists. While that unionist sentiment, it wavered up and down the Shenandoah Valley, in a place like Martinsburg and Berkeley County, it really proved to be, in my estimation, a bastion of unionism. So of all of the counties in the Shenandoah Valley, Berkeley was the only one whose majority of eligible voters opposed the secession ordinance. And the vote was 1,226 opposed 428 in favor. So in the weeks leading up to the secession referendum vote on May 23rd, 1861, Unionists in Martinsburg were holding these very large gatherings at countering all of that secession sentiment. There was a newspaper correspondent who reported on a gathering of Unionists in Martinsburg on May 13th. So this is 10 days before the state referendum. This newspaper correspondent reported that the crowd of Unionists that had gathered in Martinsburg's courthouse. It was so large that the crowd not only filled up the building and poured out into the halls, it poured out into the streets as well. News of this type of activity, this really unnerved Confederate officials in the region. They didn't have to worry about strong Unionist sentiment in Shenandoah County or Warren County or other places. But in a place like Berkeley, this was of grave concern. So two days before the statewide referendum, 
Colonel Thomas Jonathan Jackson, he was not yet Stonewall, he sent a dispatch to Major General Robert E. Lee, who commanded all Virginia forces. And he wrote that in Berkeley, things are growing worse. The threats from Union men are calculated to curb the expression of Southern feeling. So with the support for the Confederacy increasing throughout the Shenandoah Valley, following Virginia's secession, the question remains as to why was Unionist sentiment in Martinsburg and Berkeley County so strong? Why does it remain so strong throughout the conflict's duration? So individuals who have studied Unionist sentiment in the Valley, my colleague Jonathan Berkey um, has, has done this um, going back to the days of his, of his uh, PhD dissertation from Penn State. And I think there are some commonalities you can see as to why individuals held Unionist sentiment. So for some individuals, and this is not only the case for the Valley, but I think across the broader South, you have religious motivations, um, you have ethnic motivations, familial connections to the North, political beliefs, but there was something different about Martinsburg. And you had this among some, but the other factor that contributed to the staunch unionist sentiment of those from Martinsburg and its immediate surrounding environs was the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. So the BNO came to Martinsburg in 1842 and really proved critical to the success of the local economy. And there was one chronicler who wrote, the economic effect of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad was very great. The wealth and welfare of the people were much improved and they realized that a new era had begun. Now, throughout the conflict, Confederate soldiers who passed through Martinsburg, they believed that the BNO was the most significant factor, which made, as one Confederate soldier wrote, most of the people into bitter Unionists. Confederate artillerist John Hampton Chamberlain, for example, he believed that the BNO ruined, that was his word, ruined Martinsburg and Berkeley County for the Confederacy. William White of the Third Richmond Howitzers, he concurred. On September the 18th, 1862, White penned in his diary that Martinsburg is very different in character from other localities in the Shenandoah Valley because it was situated along the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. But Unionist sentiment in and around Martinsburg, it not only proved anomalous due to the quantity of Unionists there, but also I think it's somewhat of an anomaly in the Valley because of how aggressively Unionists supported the Union war effort. So I think there's no denying the reality that Unionists throughout the Shenandoah Valley did things to undermine the Confederate war effort. So perhaps most notably, you know, where Rocktown history is located, um, Unionists in Rockingham County, they organized a Unionist Underground Railroad which spirited military uh, men of military age out of the valley to avoid conscription into Confederate service. But they did so usually clandestinely. They're, they're not broadcasting this. And Unionists customarily up and down the valley were, were very secretive about what they did, largely for reasons of self-preservation. But in Martinsburg, that doesn't necessarily seem to be always, at least, um, the case. So less than one month after Virginia's secession referendum. There was a contingent of Confederate cavalry, commanded by then Colonel Jeb Stewart, arrived in Martinsburg with one particular mission, and that was to burn the Colonnade Bridge, which carried the BO over Burke Street. So this bridge was given to the citizens of Martinsburg by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad as a quote unquote, a special compliment to the city. And the bridge was constructed in the early part of the 1840s. Well, around eight o'clock 
June uh, 13th, Stuart's men destroyed the bridge, which was not only important to transportation, but this was one of the community's architectural landmarks. John Curtis, who was a resident of Martinsburg, he wrote that the bridge's destruction incensed the Union men very much. And in the immediate wake of that bridge's destruction, and in the days that followed, railroad workers, they showed their great disapproval for what these Confederate soldiers had done. As a contingent of Confederate soldiers, a company that Curtis believed um, hailed from Clark County, Virginia. So as this Confederate company from Clark County is drilling in the square in front of the courthouse, there was a large crowd of Unionists that gathered around those troops and they started shouting at the Confederate soldiers. Then the, the situation began to escalate. They started throwing stones and other things at these soldiers. Well, there was a stone that actually struck one of these Confederates. And Curtis, who was watching this unfold, he wrote that the Confederates brought their guns to shoulder ready to shoot. So this situation is beginning to intensify by the minute. Then something happened that was just unbelievable to the witnesses. The crowd then made a break toward the Confederate soldiers. So they're actually you know, unarmed and going to try to attack these Confederates. Well, not wanting to have this situation escalate any further, the troops retreated into a building that was known as Grantham Hall, located at the southwest corner of King and Queen Streets. And once those Confederate soldiers retreated to inside of that building, the Unionists, according to the surviving accounts, they were outside just hooting and hollering and shouting as one individual wrote for some time. Now, if that's 10 minutes, an hour, we don't know, but it was enough that this individual thought it was a considerable amount of time. The anger, the ire of Martinsburg's Unionists, it only increased days later when Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston, who at the time was the overall commander of Confederate forces in the Jonathan Jackson to proceed to Martinsburg and destroy the B&O shops to prevent their use by Union troops. Now, although Jackson disapproved of the order of destroying all of this equipment, he thought that ultimately it should be brought to, um, you know, it should be taken, it should be confiscated and then sent to Richmond for the benefit of the Confederacy, Jackson carried out this order on June the 20th. As Jackson's troops engaged in the work of what one of his men called an act of vandalism, tearing up track, burning uh, the roundhouse, destroying the various shops, destroying 56 locomotives, 305 coal cars, the Unionists of Martinsburg, they looked on in a state of complete and utter disbelief. There was one female Unionist who was so incensed by what these Confederate soldiers had done that she went up to a contingent of Confederate soldiers and verbally chastised them and said that she could not wait for the moment when General Winfield Scott would come and capture them and execute every single one who had perpetrated this crime against their livelihood. While surviving accounts suggest that the Unionists who displayed outrage against Confederates in the war's opening months were both male and female, I think the evidence also suggests that it didn't take all that long for male youths in Martinsburg to assume a much more cautious posture when Confederate troops were near. So for example, during the Union retreat from Winchester on May 25th, 1862, they're coming you know, north through Martinsburg, heading towards the Potomac River. There were a number of male Unionists from Martinsburg and Berkeley County who joined General Banks's column as it marched toward Williamsport, Maryland. David Hunter Strother, who you see there on the screen, many of you um, 
know already, he was a, a native of Martinsburg. He served on General Banks' staff at the time. He recorded in his journal that there were a number of loyal male citizens who joined our train of refugees for Maryland. But this movement northward, it wasn't permanent. Once Union forces regained control of the area around Martinsburg by the first week of June, those male Unionists, they returned. And David Strother, he wrote about this. You know, he, he was coming to Martinsburg on June 3rd as he wrote to visit some friends in Martinsburg. And he noted that the road was alive with refugees returning to the community. Now, although some people might look at the decision to refugee might be viewed as being done as uh, out of an overabundance of caution, or perhaps even seen as cowardly by some individuals. I think looking at this with a, a greater degree of, of perspective, I think the evidence indicates that the decision for these white male unionists, especially those of military age to flee, it proved a rather wise decision. Since the war's outset, Confederate troops who entered Martinsburg, they took various measures to suppress, to silence those white males who in some way were trying to undermine the Confederate war effort. So for example, in June of 1861, so this would be right around the time of the destruction of the Colonnade Bridge, troopers from the 1st Virginia Cavalry arrested a whole host sports of male Unionists. One of them was 25-year-old George Zepp, and he was charged and locked up for two things. The first charge against him was for advocating the Union cause, and the second thing was he refused to join their army. Now, Zepp didn't remain in, in jail for too long. Now, it's unclear if he escaped or was released, but by the time Robert Patterson's army United States troops arrived in Martinsburg during the first week of July. Zepp was out and he offered his services to not only Patterson, but later in the conflict to General Banks and then in 1864 to General Philip Sheridan. And he served all of those commanders as both a scout and detective. And Zepp understood I mean, the, the, the documentary evidence bears this out. He understood that the deeper he got, the greater risk he ran of not only being arrested by Confederates, but also being executed by them. And so he had to be very, very careful about making certain that when Confederate troops were nearby, he wasn't around because he knew that he had a target on his back, in essence. John Dalwick who was 46 years old set of the war. This was a guy that was described by one Martinsburg unionist as a good union man as there was in Berkeley County. Dalwick supported the union war effort in various ways. So when General Roderick Patterson's forces occupied Martinsburg in early July of 1861, Dalwick went around to his fellow unionists and collected money that could be used to pay someone to make a United States flag. So on July 12th, Dalwick, along with Mary Miller, who we'll talk a little bit more about later on this evening, they presented a flag made of wool, the flag that you see there on the screen, to the 11th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. The chaplain of that regiment, William Henry Locke, he noted that this was a beautiful national flag presented to the regiment in acknowledgement of our first victory over the rebels at Falling Waters. But Dalwick's commitment to the Union war effort extended far beyond his activities in the summer of 1861. So throughout the war, Dalwick loaned Union soldiers money Along with his wife, Catherine, they nursed wounded and six Union soldiers at various points. There were all kinds of 
you know, skirmishes and battles that happen in and around Martinsburg. So they, they use their time, their talents, their resources to care for them. But I think what's perhaps most significant of all is that Dalwick took it upon himself to hide Union soldiers who had been separated from their commands during various retreats through Martinsburg and then guided them when all was clear and safe to Union lines. While male Unionists such as Dalwick and Zepp supported the Union war effort in civilian non-combatant capacities, there were others who of course enlisted in the Union Army. So what you see reflected there on the screen, I think this number actually is going to tick up um, in the coming months and years because I have students who now have been, have been engaged for the past two summers looking at the 1890 veteran census. And so we're able to tease out some more uh, males who were born and bred in the Shenandoah Valley who enlisted in United States regiments. But the statistics we have for now, so there's almost 200 men from Martinsburg and Berkeley County who enlisted in one of two companies organized in Berkeley. 103, you can see there, who enlisted in Company C of what became 3rd West Virginia Cavalry, and then 66 who enlisted in Company B of what became the 1st West Virginia Infantry. But the evidence also suggests there are other Unionists from Martinsburg and its immediate surrounding environs who ventured into Maryland and enlisted in the 1st Maryland U.S. or they enlisted in companies organized by Ward Hill Lamont in Williamsport, Maryland. So again, as I said, although we don't yet have precise numbers, I think when you look at what we do now, and you juxtapose that against the total enlistment of men from Berkeley County who served in one of five Confederate companies. I think, again, it offers some additional perspective on the strength of unionist sentiment in the area. So we do know that there were 381 individuals from Berkeley County who served in Confederate regiments. So if you take all those numbers, you're looking at a minimum and again, as I've suggested, I think the more we research this, this number will tick up. You've got at least 35 to 40% of the males who are serving in this conflict are serving in United States regiments. You don't see this in, other, in any other county in the Shenandoah Valley. Now, as Martinsburg's male unionists supported the war effort in various capacities, so too, of course, did the female unionists. Throughout the conflict, female unionists offered care, they offered comfort, as we've already talked about with Catherine Dalwick, to wounded union soldiers. They did whatever they could to alleviate their sufferings. And I wanna highlight a few of these women. So two of the more well-known female unionists were two women in their 20s. Both of them worked as seamstresses, seamstresses. And you see them in this sketch here that was done by James Taylor. And they are Amanda and Anne Hafter. According to James Taylor, who was that artist correspondent, the Hafner sisters, they cared for the sick and wounded Federals. They supplied refreshments and coffee to hungry and thirsty stragglers seeking their commands. Bridget Delaney, who was an Irish immigrant, 51 years old at the outset of the conflict, she performed similar work. When James Taylor interviewed Delaney in 1864, he believed, and this is what he wrote, that Delaney had done more for the boys in blue than anyone in Martin's it's pretty remarkable when you stack her up against some of these other Unionists I've already mentioned. Throughout the conflict, Union soldiers, including Captain George Sexton of the 3rd West Virginia Cavalry, he testified to Delaney's tireless efforts to support the Union war effort. 
in a conversation that Sexton had with James Taylor in 1864, Sexton told Taylor, he said, that Delaney, the good soul, is always on the go and never seems to have a moment to spare for rest. Despite the praise, despite the adulation that had been heaped upon Delaney by Taylor, Sexton, and so many others, she did not believe that she deserved any of it. She insisted that there were plenty other women in Martinsburg and Berkeley County who did far more for the cause of union than she did. And Delaney, she told Taylor, because Taylor kept heaping all this praise in her, and she told him, there are plenty of my sex here who do much more for the boys. God bless them. Nonetheless, Union soldiers who were cared for by Delaney appreciated what she had done so much so, and I find this absolutely astonishing, they appreciated what she had done so much so that they ventured back to Martinsburg in the decades after the conflict to visit and to pay their respects to her. Among those soldiers who came back was a veteran of the 5th New York Cavalry. His name was Sergeant George Toms. Sergeant Toms came to Martinsburg in 1891. He visited with Delaney, who of course was, was getting up there in years at this point in her life. And he wrote an article for the National Tribune, which was a weekly newspaper published for the benefit of Union veterans. He wrote an article recounting this visit with Delaney. And he continued to praise her for all that she did for not only him, but his comrades in the Union Army. But as he closed out that article, he urged his comrades, particularly those who enjoyed financial prosperity in the aftermath of the war, to find it in their hearts to be charitable, to send money to Delaney who had fallen on a hard time. She was getting older. You know, she's 81 years old at this stage of the game. She wasn't able to get around. And there was money that started to pour into Bridget Delaney's home. And she died two years later in 1893. I think that the amount of, of love and respect and admiration that was poured out for Bridget Delaney is probably without precedent among unionists anywhere in the Valley. While the work that the Hafner sisters and Delaney performed, I think proved sort of typical ways that females supported the union war effort. The devotion of Martinsburg's women to the union also manifested itself in other ways. So sometimes you have instances of open defiance where these female unionists in Martinsburg have, have simply had enough of the Confederacy and they weren't afraid to show it. So on June 14th, 1863, following the Battle of Martinsburg, so this is all much, this is all part of the much larger uh, engagement many of you know as Second Battle of Winchester. But after the fighting in Martinsburg was over, after portions of Confederate General Robert Rhodes' division defeated Union General Daniel Tyler's command. And as those Confederates start marching through Martinsburg, there was one female Unionist. She just wanted to let those Confederate soldiers know how she felt. And reportedly, this is coming from Confederate soldiers who relayed this incident, took some kind of a, a, a large stick or something akin to a paddle and went up to a captain in the 2nd North Carolina Infantry, his name was John Gorman, and just started smacking him with it. And they had a heck of a time uh, getting this female Unionist off of Captain Gorman. And it wasn't until uh, another North Carolinian, Frank Harney of the 14th North Carolina, it wasn't until he intervened and he told the woman, if you don't stop, <clears throat> Gorman is going to pull every hair out of your head. Several weeks later, during 
the Confederate retreat following their defeat at the Battle of Gettysburg. The Unionists in Martinsburg, they offered food and water to Union prisoners of war who were being escorted south. So while Unionists, male and female, young and old, offered foodstuffs, Union prisoners made particular note of the courage of Martinsburg's female Unionists. Among those was an officer from the 2nd Wisconsin, Wisconsin Infantry. His name was R.K. Beecham. So Beecham had been captured during the first day uh, of fighting at Gettysburg, and he wrote that the ladies of Martinsburg, the Unionist ladies, they were especially persistent in trying to provide food and comfort to us. As these prisoners of war were being marched through Martinsburg, these female unionists were rushing up and offering them, you know, cakes and biscuits and cracker, crackers and loaves of bread, all kind of food stuff. The Confederate soldiers were taking every step they could in order to avoid these union POWs from having access to it. And Beecham recalled one episode where an unidentified Confederate officer threatened a group of women with his sword. And he thought, you know, when this Confederate officer was pulling out his sword, that these women would back off, but they seemed to become even more belligerent. And Beecham wrote about this in the National Tribune, and there was an illustration that went along with the story, and the illustration from that story is what you're looking at on the screen right there. And Beecham recalled that one of these female unionists approached a Confederate officer with cheeks glowing with the fire of indignation and in contempt of his authority, with the fire of indignation and her eyes flashing defiance, told the Confederate, oh, you needn't think you can scare us with that. Slightly more than a year later, during the first week of July, 1864, when Confederate troops commanded by General John C. Breckinridge entered Martinsburg to carry out Jubal Early's orders to seize all of the goods in the stores in that community, to burn all the bridges in the area. Mary Miller, who I introduced you to earlier as one of the individuals who presented that flag to the 11th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. Mary Miller used this opportunity to show her disdain and anger for Breckenridge and his troops. Breckenridge's troops passed in front of Miller's home on Union Hill, which was a place named so by Martinsburg's Confederate sympathizers due to the very large number of Unionists who lived in that area. She snatched up an American flag, wrapped herself in it, as you see here in this Taylor sketch. She stood in the middle of the street and reportedly chastised these Confederate troops as quote unquote shame faced traitors who are fighting against the flag of their country. Weeks after the episode, Taylor spoke with Miller and noted that she was unintimidated by their threat of bullet and bayonet. Miller was terribly in earnest, an example of reckless courage and grit. As remarkable as all of this might seem, what is one of my favorite stories um, involves what you see illustrated here on the screen. On October the 1st, 1862, there were approximately 700 Union cavalry commanded by General Alfred Pleasanton, who had made a reconnaissance to Martinsburg. Well, when Pleasanton's men made that reconnaissance to Martinsburg, Confederate General Wade Hampton's cavalry <coughs> was already positioned right in the center of the town. Pleasanton arrived on Martinsburg's outskirts around two o'clock that afternoon and ultimately ended up driving Hampton from Martinsburg. But none of that would have been achieved. None of that would have been possible 
without the community's female unionists taking it upon themselves to very hastily repair a bridge which stood in the shadows of the old colonnade bridge. So if you're looking at the, the sketch here, these are those columns of that colonnade bridge. This body of water right here is Tuscarora Creek. And this is the bridge over Burke Street. It's a bridge that I drive over almost every day. I live in Martinsburg. This act of these women rebuilding this bridge so that Pleasanton's men could get across it. And then once Pleasanton's men had come in, did what they needed to do, they tore it up so that Hampton's men wouldn't be able to get out easily. When Alfred Pleasanton learned what they had done, he, he was just, he was speechless. He couldn't simply believe it. Pleasanton wrote in his report, he made a special mention of this in his official report of that fight on October 1st. He said, when he learned that the ladies of the place had turned out and built them up, for my men to cross, meaning the bridges. He thought that it was a remarkable example, as he wrote, of the exhibition of the loyalty <coughs> and devotion in the present great struggle for national existence. These varied acts of support for the union among area unionists created a sense of dread among some Confederate soldiers whenever they approached Martinsburg and Berkeley County. Again, despite the fact that Martinsburg and those immediate environs contain Confederate sympathizers, the number and boldness of the area's unionists, as I've already argued this evening, it was without parallel. Ted Barclay, who served in the 4th Virginia Infantry, he wrote in June of 1861 that Martinsburg was the meanest abolition hole on the face of the earth. More than a year later, Another Confederate soldier and artillerist, William White, wrote that Martinsburg was a quote unquote detestable place. Some Confederate officers feared area unionists so much that they prohibited their troops from drinking out of the wells in Martinsburg and immediate areas around it because they thought that it would not be past uh, the, the unionists to poison those wells. Some Confederates believe that Unionist sentiment was so strong in Martinsburg that it shouldn't be called Martinsburg, it should instead be called Little Massachusetts. This was a, a nickname that the community's Unionists it proudly accepted, accepted as one of, you know, one of the Unionists noted, they said, we saw this as a compliment to our spirit, our patriotism, and our civilization. One of the things that is always very difficult for a historian to do is to quantify things. And while it's difficult to quantify the, the precise impact that Martinsburg's Unionists had on the course of the Civil War in the Valley, I think if you take in totality their military service, scouting, secreting Union soldiers, caring for wounded troops, providing foodstuffs and supplies, all this stuff proved important. It proved critical to overall Union success. While in the decades after the war, various Union soldiers reflected fondly about Martinsburg's Unionist sympathizers in regimental histories, reminiscences, and articles in the National Tribune, I think it was a soldier from New York. His name was Orwin Balch served in the 147th New York. He passed through Martinsburg in July of 1863 as a prisoner of war. One of those soldiers captured at the Battle of Gettysburg, just like Beecham, who I mentioned earlier. And I think it was Balch who really best explained and expressed very succinctly the strength of Unionist sentiment in Martinsburg. After Balch watched Confederate soldiers threaten and threaten and arrest a male Unionist for attempting to feed starving, tired 
exhausted Union soldiers. And he saw this individual stand up firmly against those Confederates. He thought that this person was the epitome, as he wrote, of a true and brave man. Balsh thought that Martinsburg was a place unlike any other community that he had been in south of the Potomac River. Decades after the conflict, as he was recounting this story in the National Tribune, he wrote of the uniqueness of Martinsburg's unionists, and I will close my remarks this evening with this observation. He wrote, I must say that the strongest sentiment was manifested in this place that I have been during the time that I have been in service. And I find that, you know, of all the communities he would have been in, I find that a truly remarkable, revealing statement. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Well, Jonathan, uh, thank you so much. It was a, a really fascinating talk. And, and I really believe, I'm sure you agree with me that unionism in the Valley is a, a subject that really needs more attention. And it's a, a fascinating story. Uh, we have one question. And I'm going to relay and I encourage everybody to, to think about some questions and please put them in the, the question and answer uh, bar, whatever you call that thing. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get to you as we can. So this goes back towards the beginning of uh, your talk, Jonathan, uh, talking about the vote against secession. Uh, and, and the question is, of the voters who voted against secession, some had different reasons for doing so. Uh, did Berkeley County's delegates say why they voted against it both times? So those, those unions, Pendleton and those unionists, the other unionist delegate, did they, they explain uh, why they voted the way they did? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so it's interesting, when you look at, at Pendleton and Hamilton, or Hammond, they're a little bit different. So Hammond, um, he voted against secession both times, and then he changed his vote. Um, after the ordinance was already passed, and then he signed it. Pendleton, um, I mean, he was, he was very staunch unionist. Pendleton did not believe, I, I think like a lot of unionists, in the constitutionality of secession. So there are, you know, to, to kind of maybe expand this out a little bit beyond um, Martinsburg and Berkeley County, I'm thinking of John Lewis from Rockingham County. So he voted against secession both times, and he, you know, advocated very strongly um, in the in the days leading up to the vote to choose delegates that secession is not something you constitutionally can do. So I think for a lot of these um, individuals, it is the very very clear belief that there is nothing in the Constitution that allows you to say, we don't like it here, we want out. Okay. We have a, a few more questions. Uh, how much of a role did religion and local congregational leaders play in unionist sentiment? Mm -hmm. uh, and did this differ from surrounding counties? So a question about kind of the intersection of, of religion and, and unionism. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, certainly, Berkeley County, and I'm going to, I think it's really good to kind of juxtapose Berkeley in the northern part and Rockingham in the southern part of the valley. When you look at a place like Rockingham, um, there is, there are pockets of, of very strong unionism there. And I think that falls more along the lines of religious groups. Um, so, you know, Mennonites, Dunkers, um, Quakers, who, who are not supporting the Confederate cause because of their religious beliefs. Um, I think when you get into, into Berkeley County, there are certainly pockets of Quakers in Berkeley County, um, pockets of Mennonites. I don't believe that, that it's as large in population. I'd have to, to look up the numbers. I don't believe though they're as large in Berkeley as they are in Rockingham. So religion certainly does play a factor uh, for some individuals um, in, in cultivating their unionist sentiment. And certainly, you know, congregational leaders are going to have influence, or at least hope, that members of their respective faiths are not going to support secession and support the Confederacy. 
But again, I think what makes Martinsburg and Berkeley unique is, is that added dimension of the B&O that you don't have in other parts um, further south. And I would recommend also, um, since we're on it, you know, as, as my colleague Jonathan pointed out, there's a lot of work that really needs to be done on, on unionism in the Valley. Um, I, I think, you know, aside from a handful really of, of historians, there's not even people who really give it much thought that there were these, you know, dissenters within the region. But I would strongly recommend, there's a, a multi-volume set um, that was published by the Brethren Mennonite Heritage Center in Dayton, Virginia, which offers transcriptions and analysis of Southern Claims Commission reports from Rockingham County. And that's really just a, a wealth of, of information um, into understanding unionist sentiment in one county. Um, you know, a lot of the stories that I was able to, to share with you tonight about Dalwick and Zepp and others comes from those Southern Claims Commission reports from Berkeley. And also I think for the religious aspect of things, uh, a really good friend, a good historian, recently retired from Bridgewater College, Dr. Steve Longenecker, uh, wrote a book uh, about religion in the Valley in the during the Civil War era. I think it's Religious Outsiders in the Mainstream. Is that title ring a bell to you, Jonathan? Sounds about right. Yeah, and, and this is also, I think, you know, offers some, some really important insight as to how religious beliefs shaped um, pro-unionist thinking in the Valley. Now, I'm going to piggyback just real real quick and we'll get to our next question. You know, when you kind of alluded to this many, many years ago, I was doing research uh, in, in Berkeley County and, and in Martinsburg. And I remember going to the Historical Society there and mentioning, you know, that, that Martinsburg was, was pretty unionist, you know, during the war. And the re response was, no, we were 85% Confederate. I mean, you know, they had, had a number for me and everything. So I really think this is a story that kind of the lost cause has, has taken over and kind of put on the, the back burner, uh, this idea that, that, that the South and the Valley was all united behind the Confederacy is obviously not the, not the case. Yeah, and I recently um, had a historian friend of mine who's, who's from this area uh, sent me an email, I won't mention the, the person, but he said um, he was so happy to see this article I wrote for America's Civil War about Martinsburg's unionists because he said, I've been trying to convince people for years, like Jonathan Berkey has been, that unionism was pretty strong. Um, and they would give that sort of response that that you had that no, it wasn't, and 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 clearly it is. Well, in, in some ways, a little bit of a, a, a clunky uh, transition, but there's a, a question that dealing with Charles James Faulkner of Martinsburg. And so he spoke out against secession throughout the Civil War. Uh, insisting it was unjustifiable, and yet he was also chief of staff on Stonewall Jackson's uh, staff, rather, you know, in 62 and 63. And so the question is, how common do you think it was for other individuals in the lower Shenandoah Valley to have such mixed sympathies or conflicting loyalties, uh, even if they never dared speak up about them? Yeah, look, I think it's, you know, from, from my standpoint, this is not an easy decision for people. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier in my, in my remarks, you know, the, the term conditional unionists. So these are people who um, decided they were going to support the union war effort, you know, support union, not the union war effort, but support union. And then Virginia makes that decision to leave. And, and again, it's, it's what do you do? And, you know, I, I think people in their identity and allegiance, they think about things differently than, than we do today. Um, I see myself as a United States citizen before I see myself as, you know, a transplanted West Virginian. Um, so I think people have this struggle of how do you, um, how do you balance that, you know, loyalty to, to union versus loyalty to your neighbors and your social circles and um, the place where you've lived and worked your whole life. So, yeah, I mean, I think there are people who are who are torn by this. Um, it, it's not an easy decision. So, you know, civil war is not only dividing the nation and communities, it's dividing individuals. I mean, there, there's really this sort of internal struggle, but there comes a point in time where you you got to make a choice. Um, 
And I think there are some people, quite honestly, who don't who don't make a choice. So there are people in the valley who I who I would classify as leave aloners, um, who just you know they wanted to live isolated. They wanted to be insulated from the conflict, but nature of, of the war in the valley wouldn't allow that to happen. Yeah, I, I think I'll add on a little bit there too, and see if you agree with this. I mean, I think you'd be more respected if you were a consistent in your position, right? And, and you know, I don't know about Martinsburg, but as you were talking about Martinsburg, I was thinking a lot about Winchester, mm -hmm. like a mirror image of some of the things that you're talking about. Uh, but, you know, if you were well known as, as a, a unionist and you're consistent with that, I think your secessionist neighbors might give you a grudging respect, especially as the war goes on and, you know, both sides begin to suffer equally. Uh, but yeah, that, that notion of loyalty is such a, a fluid concept in this region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. Faulkner is a great example of that as well. Yep, absolutely. All right, so a uh, question about, uh, were railroad men predominantly union, union sympathizers? Uh, and this person's thinking of an ancestor from, from Western Port Piedmont, who at this time was an engineer on the B&O. So were railroad men predominantly union sympathizers in your, in your view? Yeah, I mean, certainly when you when you look at, at the Martinsburg example, I would say yes, because it is um, it's tied to their livelihood. So there's their economic interests are tied to the fate of the union. Okay, we've got a question about uh, Berkeley County. Okay, so was Berkeley County uh, a unionist majority uh, after the war started or majority Confederate, but the unionist minority was very active and vocal? Hmm. Yeah, so, you know, it's sort of, again, I think it's difficult um, to put numbers on it. I mean, if you look at, if you look at the number of soldiers who enlisted, as I said, it's probably around 40% of those who served are United States and the remainder Confederate. Um, but whether, I mean, I don't know if, I don't want to say it's a 50-50 split, but kind of, you know, when you're looking at the statistics, maybe that's how it plays out. Um, as the war progresses, you don't see that concentration of unionists anywhere else in the valley. Um, so are they a minority? Eh, it's, it's hard to say. Maybe not. I think it might approach half, but they are certainly vocal um, about it. They are certainly um, much more aggressive. And, you know, they feel that they can be aggressive because they do have, there are many more individuals there. There is strength in numbers that you don't have in other parts um, of the Valley. So again, I mentioned the, the Unionist Underground Railroad activity in uh, Rockingham County. They're doing what they can, but they're, they're trying to stay quiet about it. You don't have, you know, people like Mary Miller in Shenandoah County coming out wrapping themselves in the Confederate flag and chastising confederate troops and martinsburg is one of those places that you know for a huge chunk of the war it's more controlled by union soldiers than confederates so i think there's always this sense of confederates are not going to be here for an extended period of time and we're in a much safer position than we are say 20 miles south in a place like winchester so i think that that plays into it I was thinking, you know, we, we don't have numbers, right? But but I can't picture, you know, Julia Chase and a bunch of unionists in Winchester presenting a flag to a, a union regiment. I mean, that's just not going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I think I think we have this anecdotal evidence that suggests that this place has enough of a unionist feeling that you you can do that out in the open, and everybody knows that you're doing it. Right. In other places that they wouldn't be able to get away with. Yep. Got a really interesting question. I, I I'm I'm glad to. Uh, get this question out that we can talk about a little bit. Uh, were unionists generally also abolitionists or were there exceptions to the general rule? I think it's very interesting to, to talk about this. A little yeah, bit. this is a great question. So um, there is no direct correlation between someone being pro-union and also being an abolitionist. So, um, and this isn't a Martinsburg example, but this is a Winchester example. So Julia Chase who was a, a well-known unionist sympathizer in Winchester, Jonathan just mentioned her. Um, she was not all that happy when she learned of the Emancipation Proclamation and then subsequently General Robert Milroy's enforcement of it. 
So yeah, there is no correlation there. And what's interesting is when you look at some of the, the discussions that were going on during the time of the secession convention vote and the, and the election for delegates to that convention, there was a, a resolution in Winchester, uh, I believe, which basically stated that remaining in the union was actually the best way to protect the institution of slavery. Um, so there is, there is not a direct correlation. Now, are some unionists abolitionists? Yes. Are all unionists abolitionists? No. A, a couple of things I want to maybe point back to some, some other issues, right? I mean, so this question of defining unionism, right? And, and I'd say, you know, if you're leaning towards abolition, that's certainly on the outskirts of your community, right? And, and, and nobody's really going to be you know, they might be grudgingly tolerate you because you're a political unionist, but, you know, that might be moving beyond the, the pale of acceptance. And, and certainly after the war during Reconstruction, this becomes a problem, right? Because you have these unionists who aren't really interested in uh, Black civil rights or political rights. And, and it's a problem because they've been loyal through the war, so they can vote. And, and they're voting conservative Democrat, right? They're not, they're not voting with Republicans. So, so yeah, it's so a really interesting question to, to look at. I got to follow up on the uh, kind of the numbers of unionists. Uh, and so the, the suggestion here is that maybe the county was 50-50 or so, but Martinsburg more definitely union. I mean, would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I think that's certainly a fair assessment at, at this stage of the game. I mean, within, I would say within the environs of, of the city of Martinsburg, absolutely. And I, I got a, a question uh, in, in the chat here. Let me see if I can, can uh, find it here. So. Uh, were Martinsburg unionists uh, influential politically in accelerating the formation of West Virginia? Mm. Another interesting question. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so maybe not as much as you would think. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of that, my understanding, um, and there's a there's a new book out came out a year ago, Eric Wittenberg and two. I think it's two other attorneys wrote it called Seceding from Secession. Um, a lot of that sort of support for creating um, what becomes West Virginia is coming more from the further western part um, of the state than, than the areas around Martinsburg um, and Berkeley County. And yeah, there's another uh, question in the chat. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, so uh, Kimberly writes that that uh, she's recently purchased uh, a home that was standing during the Battle of Piedmont in the Valley, fascinated by the fact that the home was not damaged if the Union came through, especially since the Confederates had artillery hit there on the farm. Uh, and she wants to know, how do we research whether the family were Union sympathizers? Mm. I mean, what kind, what kind of sources could people look to if they wonder if, you know, maybe their relatives were, were Unionists and how to, how to figure that out? Yeah, I mean, the, the easiest thing to do is to look um, through the Southern Claims Commission reports. So if you have a fold3.com um, account, and I think you can usually get like a five or seven day trial if you don't have one, um, all of those Southern Claims Commission reports um, are viewable online. So you have claims that are allowed. So those are claims that were paid by the federal government after the war, and then claims that are, that are disallowed. So for whatever reason, the federal government decided um, to not compensate individuals, but that's where I would start. Southern Claims Commissions are really such a, a wealth of information for historians who are researching unionist sentiment, because again, one of the problems that we have is there, there, I think so many of them, particularly where, where you're at in Piedmont, they're not broadcasting like you are in Martinsburg that, hey, I'm a unionist. Um, so really, you know, unionists after the war, they want to be financially compensated for damage done to their property or things that were taken during the conflict. And there are literally thousands of these, you know, reports that were filed, these claims that were filed. And that's, that's the first place, um, that I would start. Well, that's all the, the question we have right now. I can maybe ask you one more question and see if anybody has, has anything else they want to kind of jump in here with. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to uh, 
and uh, Penny notes that the Rocktown uh, Research Library offers that Fold3 access to, to local researchers. So yeah, please do uh, uh, check that out if you're, you're, you're in the area. Uh, when we go back to this mirror image of Winchester, you know, in Winchester, there's a lot of, got a lot of secessionist diaries, some unionist diaries, and, and they're always talking about one another. And can you believe what the secessionists did? Can you believe what the unionists did? Do you have any evidence of a similar dynamic in Martinsburg where kind of, you know, do we know what the secessionists are saying in Martinsburg or is it mainly the surviving documents more unionist? Yeah, so there are, there are some diaries um, not, as, not as well known um, as, you know, like Mary Lee or Julia Chase or um, Laura Lee's diary. But Berkeley County Historical Society has published, you know, in their journals or special editions you know, excerpts from some of these diaries and at least from Confederate sympathizers. And it's kind of interesting to go through some of these because I think the Confederate sympathizers are, are maybe astonished at the brazenness of the Unionist sympathizers um, and supporters for, I mean, there's, there's one account that sticks out in my mind and I, I can't remember who wrote it off the top of my head, um, but I think it was early in the war where there were a group of, of Unionist females who basically came to this house where they knew um, there were a group of women, you know, making things for the Confederacy and they just like drug them out of the house and expelled them and sent them south um, toward Winchester. But yeah, I think there's, there's sort of always been this, not to go off on too much of a tangent, but there's been sort of this divide, like, you know, people think the valley stops at the state line um, and, and, you know, Berkeley County, Jefferson County has kind of really been ignored um and it's 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 it adds such an interesting complex dimension and and muddies the waters even further about the civil war in the valley uh okay well let me ask you this i know you, you've talked about a lot of stories what was what's your favorite story about unionism uh in in this in Martinsburg, Berkeley County. And before I get to, we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. So if, if anybody has any questions we haven't gotten to, please do put them in the chat or in the the, the question bar, and we'll we'll try to get to them before we wrap up here. I think my favorite story is the uh, the the women rebuilding and taking apart that bridge over Tuscarora Creek. Um, and I you know every I mean I drive that way to go through downtown Martinsburg almost every day. Um, and it just to me, it's just this remarkable kind of thing because, you know, we see like, you know, Rebecca Wright in Winchester, you know, what she does as a spy. That's all, you know, clandestine. It doesn't come out until after the war. And you see sort of the, you know, the traditional, you know, taking care of wounded and all that kind of stuff. But to go out there in the middle of a, of a battle, in essence, to build a bridge so that Union Cavalry can cross. And then after they get back across, you take it up. And that to me is just such a remarkable story that that really is a is a testament to the strength of unionism. I think the fearlessness of of those female unionists in in Martinsburg. And, and I'm going to make an assumption that there's no no signage or markage on markings on that bridge to to denote this. So they yeah, there's not they they just put in that whole bridge area underneath Burke Street was just um, redone recently. There is signage there, but it talks more about the, the Colonnade Bridge site and, and those types of things. I'm gonna, gonna give one last uh, uh, check here. I don't see anything else on the uh, chat. It looks like uh, Penny's uh, rejoining us here. So uh, Jonathan, again, thanks so much. And, and uh, thank everybody for uh, uh, the conversation here. And I'm gonna, gonna turn it back to Penny. Yes, thank you very, very much. That was excellent. I have to say, Every time I hear you, Jonathan, you are the most clear storyteller and you can bring all of these facts together and make them so presentable for us. So I appreciate that. Thank and you. clearly um, our guest host is just as well informed and I so appreciate you continuing the conversation. And um, thank you to the audience for submitting your questions. This is you know, the vision that we had for this program and I am just, so delighted. Um, everybody, we can't see you, but I'm sure you're clapping and nodding and agreeing and thanking these two gentlemen. Um, so I will just share my screen again to give a couple more um, 
notes. But before I do back here, I'll do my little Vanna thing on that shelf. Those are the Southern Claims Commission books for Rockingham. So we, we sell them in the bookstore. We have them on our online shop. You can use them in the library. You can call and ask questions or hire a researcher, whatever, if you're interested. Um, these books are definitely available and amazing, amazing project that uh, went into collecting that information. Clearly the information would be out for um, other areas too. All right, so I said I'd share my screen. Here we go. Mostly this um, allows me to let you see what I'm talking about. If you did enjoy this program, I would love it if you would like, follow, share our Rocktown History Facebook and Instagram accounts. Uh, we also have an email sign up through our website and it just, uh, the emails come out about once a month and the social media allows us to share more tidbits and keep people engaged and answer some questions and just you know, share the fun stories that we find um, when we're, we're doing work here at Rocktown History. We do have a pre cemetery preservation workshop um, this Saturday in just a couple of days. There are a couple of slots left. So if anyone is local and had considered joining it, hadn't heard about it, there's still an opportunity. Um, all you have to do is email me and or our admin, I'll put that website up, in, I mean, that email up in just a moment. Um, but an email should come to you tomorrow thanking you for joining us this evening. And if you respond, you can certainly let me know if you are interested in the workshop, but also if you have other ideas for these third Thursday to talk programs, because I do believe that we do want to keep them going. Um, generally, our news and events are on the rocktownhistory.org website. I do not have the third Thursday talks for July and August posted. It looks like we are going to try some in-person for the summer now that everybody's, you know, the days are longer and people are breathing more freely and getting out and about and thought this would be a good opportunity to tell some very local stories um, two businesses, which began 100 years ago, are celebrating big birthdays, and so uh, we're going to have speakers talk about them. Um, July will be the Rockingham Cooperative. So um, let's see. I think I had, oh, here, you, these Third Thursday talks have always been free, and we would like to keep them that way, and so as a nonprofit organization, we do rely on the generosity of our members and donors and friends and visitors and so forth and so on. So it's easy for you if you are far away to connect, you can make a donation on the website, become a member. We would love to have you join our group of people who absolutely love local history. And other than that, I just want to say thank you. I had a few little technical glitches on my end from at the beginning of the video, so I'm hopeful. I think I got a little cocky this time because in the past I said, if it all works out, we'll have a video. Um, but uh, I think the internet was a little tenuous there at the beginning. So I'm anticipating a video for you over the weekend. And I just want to say thank you again to everybody. Stay curious, support local history, and thank you to these great researchers again for sharing your expertise with us this evening. Good night, everyone.